Hi everyone, welcome to this webinar. Today we will talk about a really exciting topic, how platform engineering is driving the evolution of developer self-service. Okay, I am Sébastien Blanc. I'm a developer relation engineer at Port and I'm really happy and excited to deliver this session to you. Okay, so without waiting, let's move to slides. And let me do that right now. Okay, there we are. So how is platform engineering drive the evolution of developer self-service? We will dive into this topic in a few seconds. Before that, let me, uh, of course, introduce myself. I'm Sebastian Blanc. You can call me Sebi. You can follow me on X and uh, at Sebi2706. Um, I have 20 years of experience uh, in the IT industry. I started as a, a software engineer. I'm still a software engineer in Java, Java Enterprise. Uh, and uh, slowly I became a, a full-time developer advocate. So my job is basically to make developers happy, to get them excited, to build relationships with developers. I'm currently a developer relation engineer at Port, a portal solution. You will see it a bit at the end of this presentation. And uh, I love the, the game of life. I'm a, a huge fan of that. And I love cats. I have myself five cats. Okay, that's enough about myself. Let's talk about um, self-service. What does self-service exactly means? Okay, uh, me as a developer, um, what does it mean if I have self-service um, components available to me? But to answer this question, let's first see when there was no self-service or that's more sad if it's still your case when there is no self-service, but things should have changed. Let's go back in the past and I will relate mine, my own story here. 20 years ago when I, I started working, uh, it was in the Netherlands in a, in a big bank. Okay. It was a really great and uh, exciting project. I, I learned a lot, um, but yeah, it was 20 years ago and we didn't really had any um, processes around uh, the software life cycle and uh, for provisioning resources. Well, it was, uh, well, we didn't, we didn't knew how to do it until now. So basically it was something like that. We didn't even had a ticketing system, right? So when I needed something or my team needed something, I just wrote an email and here it's me writing to Elmar, which is part of ops. And I say, Hey, I need a dev test environment. Could you please create a new test dev, dev environment with WebSphere 4.0? Do yay! We finally migrated. This is all also means that we need a, a new um, JDK, okay? Because we're running Java. The ear file, so that's the artifact that we deliver, um, is on the shared uh, Windows folder, okay? And uh, don't uh, don't forget to update beans.xml. But ask Robert; he knows exactly uh, how it works, okay? So I send this email, and yeah, I really need this dev test environment for for my team. And um, I get an automatic reply out of office. Oh, Elmer, he say, hi, I'm on PTO until the 14th of June. Warbird will be my backup during this time. Okay, so what I do, I, I take my previous email and uh, uh, I forward it to, um, to Robert. Hey, Robert, please. Uh, please, the email below, there's a typo there. Could you help me with this? So I forwarded in the email. I wait a bit, okay. Um, Robert was busy doing other stuff. And by the end of the day, I got an answer. I say, hey, Sebi, sure. Um, I plan it for next week, uh, Wednesday. And uh, today we are Tuesday. So, wow, I have to wait eight days before I get my uh, environment. Okay, but um, that's how it goes. Um, he's not sure how it will go with uh, upgrading GDK. He will let me know. Okay, so I'm, I'm not really sure I will have my dev test environment uh, by the end of next week. And that's a real life situation that I explain you. And that is just to have a dev test environment, but for everything, it was the same, you know, uh, going production was also by <laughs> exchanging emails and we were doing that on a Friday, of course, and we were spending the whole weekend, um, uh, to, to, to fix uh, issues. Um, setting up an, a, a new repo. Uh, well, we didn't have any any Git repo by the time. It was a, a CVS um, space, I don't know how we call it. That was all things that we had to do ourselves, uh, find out ourselves. 
and um, then we had tickets, okay? Tickets was a bit better uh, because we could at least track what was happening, okay? Um, but most of the time at the other side of the ticketing system, it was still a human handling the ticket. And um, well, I remember when I uh, started uh, in, a, in a big company here in France 10 years ago to, to get a database, I had a nice ticketing system. Uh, so I entered my ticket, I need a Postgres, etc. And then you have to wait that someone, uh, someone from the ops team pick up the, the ticket, change the status and start working on it. And then he calls you because he's not sure about the version. That's not self-service, okay? Self-service is, uh, I'm a developer, I need a Postgres. I click on a button or I type one command and I wait for a few minutes and I get my uh, resource provisioned, okay? That's what self-service is. But back in this time when we were doing that, it was not really an issue. Yeah, well, as I said, we, we didn't know how to do better. And the fact was also that we were working on a big monolithic app, okay? It was on-prem and we were doing maybe one or two releases per year. And we were not starting a lot of new projects. So yeah, we were not, not really missing the self-service, but since 20 years, for 20 years, the, the IT world have changed a little bit, okay? Um, and, uh, and, and something that is still true and was true at that moment was those walls of confusion. We had those silos. We had the project owners, okay? Uh, in a bank, it was mainly a business analyst that were throwing specs to us, okay? The developers, we were uh, coding that throwing that to uh, sysadmins and they were throwing that to ops, okay? And again, it was happening not that many times a year, so that was not an issue. But slowly IT started to change, okay? And uh, let's go back a bit, back in history. And everything that I will mention here is not as, um, necessarily in a good order in, in, uh, of the timeline, okay? But, but, but these are big things that happened and that changed the way we work and how the IT work, okay? So first of all was uh, sharing computing time and resources, okay? Um, that was Amazon, which was a really successful online retailer, and, but they noticed that they had huge data centers and they noticed that um, they were never really used at 100%, except days like Black Friday. And someone smart there say, hey, you know what? What we should do is uh, rent these resources and uh, to other people who might need it, okay? And that was uh, the first step to uh, the cloudification or yeah, there are different terms. Anyway, Amazon was the first to do that. And um, not so long after, one of their big first big customer was Netflix, okay? Because Netflix, they had uh, on-prem data centers and they had a major outage. And at one point they decided, no, we don't want that anymore. We are going to put all, all of our uh, workloads into the cloud. And they put that into AWS. And uh, that's also the moment that they decided to, to um, not work anymore with one big monolith, but shopping the monolith into a lot of small services, microservices. And um, well, Netflix has contributed a lot to, to the whole cloud native space because they were one of the first to, to work on that. And um, when you start working in the cloud and you start having microservices, you have new challenges like uh, um, fault tolerance, so resiliency, elasticity, uh, tracing, logging, and they developed a lot of libraries um, in Java using Spring Boot. That's also one of the reasons that Spring Boot uh, is so popular. Um, but they were pioneers and um, the great thing were that um, we were able to work on uh, smaller pieces of software going in production more often. Um, but one other thing changed as well because you know, I was working on my Windows machine and I was making an ear file. I could run it on my machine, but on production, it was, I don't remember what it was. It was an X uh, server, something like that. And it, it was a whole challenge. Uh, yeah, but it works on my machine. You, you, you know the, 
the, the duo. So, containers, that was the other big improvement that came. Um, containers everywhere, yeah. At least me as a developer, I, I could develop my, my, my workload, my runtime, run it in a container locally, and being pretty sure that it will uh, run exactly the same uh, on production, okay? Uh, even ops were happy in the beginning. You can see here in the beginning <laughs> that is an ops. He was happy, but yeah. Uh, again, um, when you start to have tens, thousands of, of of microservices, it can be it can quickly become a nightmare to uh, manage all of this. Okay, so microservices containers uh, go to the cloud. These are big components. Okay, that change completely the way how we worked. New methodologies came, okay, Agile, DevOps, okay, I'm not here to, I will not spend time explaining what uh, DevOps is. I won't also not spend too much time about Agile because I'm pretty opinionated on, on, uh, on Agile and on the business of Agile, okay? So I just leave this slide here. That is uh, pictures that I usually use to explain that in my opinion, um, yeah, Agile is great if you stay pragmatic if the tooling don't take over, but the, the, the whole business around Agile um, has hurt a lot our industry, okay? Anyway, the promises of agility, they say, hey, with DevOps, you can have continuous delivery, you can have self-sufficient developers, self-sufficient is pretty close to self-service, um, quality, security, compliance, and scale, and we can break the walls, the silos, okay, and we work all together. To be honest, it has worked uh, well. Um, DevOps has, the DevOps culture has infused a lot of organizations, um, but at the same time, uh, there's a, some kind of paradox because uh, a lot of things have been automated, um, and the thing is that there are, again, there are the microservices, but we as a developer, our runtime probably needs to consume a lot of other cloud resources, like an S3 bucket. Um, during development time, it needs to scan for security. Um, it needs to scan the containers images. There's a lot, a lot of things to do, okay? The, the, the developer, he, he still has to code because that's his job, okay? Uh, but he has also to, to, he has to deploy, he has to manage incidents, um, he has to stay in the standards of coding. Um, security is a really important matter. So uh, these are all respons responsibilities that came to the developer and that increased a lot his cognitive load, okay? And that's why we need to find a way to, to, to remove that friction and offer self-service components to developers to make the life easier for everyone, not just the developer, but also the ops. <laughs> Take a look, even today, uh, if you want to create, a, you start a new project, a new microservices, so you, you need to, to create a GitHub repo following the template, the standards of your organization. Um, you probably need to generate a, a token from your uh, internal security provider or from an, a third party like Okta, you need to have a, like a, a service account. Uh, then you need to store stuff, and uh, the rule in your in your company is to to store that on S3. So you have to provision an S3. Um, then you are working on the project. You you need to wait on code review. Um, every time that you merge, you want to deploy, and as often as possible, you want to uh, deploy to production. Okay, so th these are a lot of steps again. And um, the idea of self-service is to, 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 to maybe not abstract that away, uh, but at least make it easier. It's time consuming and error prone. Sorry, I forgot that there was an animation on this. So there's a lot in the mind of a developer, okay? He needs to bring uh, features to production. He, uh, time to market is really important. Um, maybe there are some features shipped into the, the software already, but they are hidden with feature flags and he, he wants an easy way to enable those flags or just enable those flags for a portion of the people. You know, if you're doing service mesh and you just want 10% of your people being able to test this uh, feature. Um, 
you will have security vulnerabilities, okay? And um, it's you are in charge, of course, working with the security to, uh, team to fix that. You need to interact with Kubernetes, okay? Um, I will have a really opinionated uh, vision on that. You can see my cap. I'm a big fan of Kubernetes. Um, the chance is big that um, if it's not today, in the future, that you will work with Kubernetes. Maybe you will work with Kubernetes without knowing it, but at least the backbone will be Kubernetes. There's a big chance for that. So that's our things to learn. Um, it's not easy. The learning curve is not, it's not small. Optimize cost, that is more for your managers and your, your execs, okay? Uh, but um, yeah, it's really easy to, to, to spin off a, a Kubernetes cluster in the cloud uh, if you forgot to, 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 to turn it off. Yeah, you can have some uh, surprises, okay? Incident management, really important to have a really good uh, quality of service. And um, yeah, the developer needs to be involved in that. So he, 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 somehow he needs to have some automated way or some self-service actions where he, based on an incident, he can uh, open, for instance, um, a workspace, an IDE that match exactly the version uh, of the software that where the, the, the bug is impacted, okay? Okay, let's continue. Uh, understand internal APIs, comply with standards. There's a lot of things. How can we offer a unified self-service experience to our developers? Okay. Um, first of all, I told you that just before, I believe that Kubernetes should be the base. So basically what I'm telling you here is to have self-service, you need a platform, okay? I'm not mentioning yet internal developer platform, but, and that's not really the topic of this talk, okay? I'm talking here just about self-service, which is a little component inside the uh, platform engineering, but the base of your platform, I believe that should be Kubernetes. It take care of, of a lot of things for you, okay? The, um, the, the concept of deployment, scaling is done for you, you have monitoring, Repairing, that means, yeah, if uh, one of your uh, nodes goes down, no issues, or your workloads will be redeployed. It's pretty easy to implement security in a nice way. Um, I love Kubernetes. It's an orchestrator, but it's not only an orchestrator, okay? So it's way more than this. Um, Kubernetes work with resources, and you have some basic building blocks in Kubernetes. You have a, a service, a pod, a deployment, um, an ingress, replica sets, okay? And these are all basing block, basing block resources, and they are applied on the cluster, defining a desired state. So basically it's a resource that you write in YAML and you say the desired state. And Kubernetes will make sure that this desired state is always respected. This is a really, really powerful concept, okay? But, the really nice thing with Kubernetes is it's just not an uh, orchestrator. It's a really good orchestrator, but it's way more than that because you have those basic building blocks, but you know what? You can create your own blocks, okay? And you can couple those own blocks, those new resources that you define, you can couple that with some logic okay, that implements this reconciliation loop, you know, we have a desired state and we want to maintain it. Well, you can implement your own resources, your custom resources, you can define them, okay, custom resource definition, we're coming to that. You couple that with a controller, which is just a resource, a pod running and watching for those resources and acting when something changed on those resources. Sounds really simple, but it's extremely powerful, okay? Two elements, a controller and a custom resource. Custom resource is comes from a custom resource definition. If you are a developer like me, uh, I'm a Java developer, so I can define a new class when I'm defining my models, my, my objects, okay? I define a class that is my CRD. And from this class, I will be able to create an instance. And in this case here, it's a custom resource. And then I have a controller over there 
that will make sure to implement the reconciliation loop. And the great thing is, well, we will see that later when I will talk about building your own operator, but it's, it's completely agnostic of any language, okay? It's just a controller, it's a pod. You put what you want inside your pod. It could be written in Go, in Java, in Bash, okay? But anyway, uh, before we see how we can build operators, let's see um, how an operator works exactly. Because before building your own operators, you probably can you will be using existing operators. All the big cloud providers or cloud vendors that have SaaS services, most of the time, they will provide also an operator coming with an custom resource definition that you can apply on your cluster, okay? To abstract away a bit the complexity of operating uh, a system. Let's take an example. Let me go the other way. First of all, if you're looking for an existing operator, uh, the best way to go is on operator.io. There you have a list of all the existing operator. And remember an operator is just a set of resources, CRDs, and some deployments to, to create your controller. And um, yeah, you have really hundreds, hundreds of operators. And let's imagine that um, I uh, need to, uh, I want to offer, whoa, sorry, that was my cat. Yeah, I want to imagine, <laughs> she, she walked on the, on the keyboard, but I won't stop the recording for that. Uh, imagine that I want to, to install a, a Kafka cluster. Okay, so let me um, search for Kafka. And you can see that I have uh, different um, operators here available. And one that I really like uh, is called uh, StreamZ, okay? StreamZ is an open source operator. It's written in Java, by the way. And, and basically, if I go to here the website, uh, Kafka on Kubernetes in a few minutes. Okay, that's super cool. It's pretty easy to install, but what is the power of, uh, of, of an operator? I will show you that immediately. So here I have my, uh, my terminal and uh, look at this. I can do kubectl, so uh, my command to interact with my, uh, with my cluster. I can say get Kafka, okay? You say no resources found, but he understands what a Kafka resource is. Okay, so if I do a kubectl describe uh, CRD for custom resource definition, Kafka, okay, I can see that here. Wow, that's pretty complex, but basically it's my API, which I can interact with that defines the CRD, the custom resource definition for me to create a custom resource for instance, called Kafka, okay? I probably have one here. So uh, if I do uh, bad Kafka, let me do persistent here, this one. So look at this, I got a kind Kafka and I got here all the details. Notice that everything here uh, is made visible. So uh, me as a developer, if I create this custom resource, I can really fine tune exactly how I want my cluster. And we will come back on that but maybe that is something that you don't want you as a platform engineer providing this platform. You don't want to open everything. But anyway, let's start from here. And um, okay, let me apply this. So I do a kubectl apply dash f Kafka persistent. There we go. And there it is. Just with this resource that I've deployed, in a few minutes, I will have a complete Kafka cluster running on my Kubernetes cluster. Let's take a look at my pods. Let's see. Look at this. Uh, for now, it's Zookeeper that is getting uh, deployed. Once my free Zookeepers have been uh, will have been deployed, I will have uh, my Kafka clusters getting getting deployed. If I look, check for services, I probably have here uh, my cluster Zookeepers client. Okay. Uh, let, he will create also a Kafka, a, a Kafka um, um, service. Okay, um, it's almost there. But the point is not to show you a running Kafka, and uh, that's for Kafka. But I can also uh, here if I go back examples, I got some probably topic. Okay, 
let me uh, show you how a topic looks like. Okay, now I have the kind Kafka topic. Just by applying this, I can create a topic, my topic. So basically, if I do kubectl apply this uh, file, Kafka topic, okay, I've created a topic. And maybe my Kafka cluster is not still running, okay, but once my Kafka cluster will be running, this CR, this custom resource, will at one point reconcile. Okay, so it's extremely powerful. Here I showed you, <coughs> sorry, here I showed you an operator that operates things inside Kubernetes. But to be honest, uh, there are a lot of operators that will operate third party API services, not necessarily running in Kubernetes. But because Kubernetes is so powerful with the reconciliation loop and it creates create the CRDs, the custom resource definition, uh, creates uh, some kind of unified API, um, some entry point. A lot of people uh, have also provided um, an operator, even if as a company, they don't do anything with, um, with Kubernetes. Uh, that is the case, for instance, uh, if I go here back to my operator app, okay. The company where I was before is Ivan. It's a um, managed uh, data infrastructure provisioning um, a service, really powerful. Okay, um, nothing really to do with, with, uh, with Kubernetes. You can provide Kafka as well, but uh, manage in a VM. But they provided also an operator so that people that are used to use operators uh, and they need a service from Ivan, they are still able to go the same route as uh, they will do with other operators. So providing a CR, applying it, it, it to the cluster and, and voila. Okay. Um, <coughs> let's, let's go back to my uh, presentation. There it is. My presentation is there. Um, so building an operator, building an operator is, is, it's, it's not that hard. Okay. Um, basically you have to write your CRD. Okay. Your custom resource definition and be really smart. Uh, when you decide to write your CRD, uh, talk with your other teams, depending on the, the service that you want to provide this service has maybe already uh, an API defined and, uh, a CRD can totally accept an open, um, an open API, uh, contract. Okay. So these are things to consider. Um, you can write your CRD and then the code to control this, the controller, you can generate your code from the CRD or you can do the opposite. You can st start, uh, first writing your, uh, your, your CRD, uh, sorry, first writing your code and that will generate the CRD. Okay. It all depends on how your teams works, but basically that's it. Define your CRD, define your controller, um, the reconciliation loop. When a new resource is applied, what should happen? Maybe I do a REST call to, uh, maybe I create a deployment and a service and an ingress. It's up to you. Okay. Um, let me just go back here and let me just realign a little bit. So, um, I also told you, you write your operator in the language that you want. Okay. The standard is because Kubernetes was written in go, uh, that a lot of operators nowadays are written in go, um, especially the older operators. But, but as I told you in the beginning, it doesn't matter in which language you write your operator. I'm a Java developer and we have a Java operator SDK now, which is really, really powerful. Um, I think it really competes with, uh, what is available with, with the go operator. Um, it's fun. It's easy to do. You can have a nice, um, experience, uh, developers experience, especially, uh, me with my, um, with my, um, uh, with my Java operator framework, I can run my operator locally. Okay. And, uh, the, the changes that I will make will be applied directly on my cluster. Uh, so maybe, maybe, maybe I can show you that instead of, uh, if uh, instead of <laughs> you see a lot of stuff there, where is my, oh yeah, there it is. Let me just bring that over there here. Okay. So 
I can show you a little bit how it looks like <coughs> um, in Java. Okay, so basically we can close this. Let me show you an object where I defined my CRD. So here I'm working with, on a really funny operator to deploy Quake free service. Okay. And uh, I have my Quake object, which is completely empty, but that contains a, a, a custom resources, which is a spec and a status. Okay. Uh, the spec is really where I will define my, um, my different properties that I want to expose. So here in a Quake server, I want a certain um, uh, a list of maps that are playable, a time limit, uh, and a minimum players. Okay, and uh, here under, if I uh, do a kubectl get Quake, okay, you can see that he understands Quake. Uh, but if I do describe uh, CRD Quake, you can probably see here back the properties that I just mentioned, minimum players, time limit, okay, and maps. That's super cool. The, the, the powerful thing here is that uh, my, my application is running locally. This operator is running locally. So if I do something like um, private string and I say, who is the best player? Okay, I don't know if it really makes sense, but uh, just to make a point here, huh? let me generate a, a getter and a setter. There we go. I save that. That should be, that will generate for me a new CRD, which is located here, and apply it just for me on the cluster. So now if I uh, want, uh, if I describe my CRD again, and if the demo gods are not playing with me, I should have here a uh, minimum player in him properties, best player. There we go best player, there it is, okay? And um, th that is huge, okay? Uh, believe me, uh, for a developer like me, uh, having this kind of developer experience. So you can write your own operators because we saw on the operator hub, there's a lot of options, but there will be a, a, a moment that uh, you probably need to write your own operator for, for a really specific custom uh, flow inside your company, okay? You can also write an operator to manage other operators. We will come back on that uh, a bit later. Uh, let me go back to my slides. Okay, there we go. Okay, so uh, operators, one of the most powerful pattern in the uh, Kubernetes world. And since Kubernetes should be your base platform, I would say uh, operators are a crucial part of your platform developer uh, uh, as your internal developer platform. Okay. It's just my opinion. I believe in it, but yeah. Uh, composing your operators, because at one point you will have, I don't know, you will be using maybe 10 different operators from different vendors. Uh, you have maybe also 10 of your own operators. Okay. And uh, you made that available to your developers. Okay, how you made that available to your developers? We will uh, come back on that because it's uh, the, the 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 core of this talk is uh, the self service. But this is the basic block, the really important block. You create your operators, or you have existing operators. How could you simplify a bit the fact that, for instance, a developer when he starts a new project, uh, he needs a Postgres. And that's fine because you have an operator that can provision Postgres for you. And he needs to deploy an image uh, in a serverless way using Knative. That's nice because you have the Knative operator, okay? But your developer needs to provide two different custom resources, okay? Maybe it's not a problem for him, but again, maybe he has no idea what Knative is and he just wants to point to an image, okay? and he knows that he needs this table on this database. Then what you could do, you could write your own operator, okay, that compose those two operators. Again, you do whatever you want in the reconciler. So if you want to go for this, go for this. And, and in some cases, it would make sense. But you have some people that start thinking, hey, would it not be possible or would it be nice if we define some 
some framework where we could compose operators. Basically, we can create a new kind of operator of custom resource. And in this case, I'm taking the example of Cratex, they defined a new concept, a new resource, which is called a promise. Okay. A promise is almost just like a custom resource definition. And by the way, in the promise YAML, you will write your CRD, but you can also specify dependencies saying, okay, this promise needs the Ivan operator. It needs uh, the, 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 the crunchy for Postgres operator. Okay. That's one thing. And you define your custom resource definition where you can abstract away everything for your developer. And then you will be writing pipelines. Okay. Um, every time, and you can add so many pipelines as you want, but in a lot of cases, just one pipeline will be enough. It will take in the custom resource definition defined in the promise. And there's just an out where it will write, uh, the custom resource definitions or even if needed, made some rest calls, but the good practice is that a CR comes in and different CRs come out. Okay. Um, that is what I show here on this, uh, on this picture here, please play with it. It's super useful. Um, it's fun to use as well. If I go here back, I probably have here a, a, an example of a pipeline. Okay. Uh, let me increase the font a bit. So that is a, a Cratex pipeline. Um, the advantage here, it, and you might think, Hey, but is it the same as writing an operator? It's not exactly the same here. First of all, um, it's way simpler. You, you have no reconciliation loop to write. You just have something coming in. Okay. Input path and you have something to write out and you just have one method. Okay. It's just an entry point. Uh, and in this case here, I have defined a database, uh, object. Okay. Which is defined in my promise in my custom resource. And based on that, um, based on some fields, I create a Postgres or a MySQL custom resource. Okay. Which is compliant with, uh, the Ivan operator. And then Cratex, when I spit out those CRs, will just apply that on my cluster. And that's super useful because you can uh, compose, you can reuse some of the pipelines. Um, you can change operators in the backend as dependency without your developer noticing it. For instance, you need a Postgres and you were using, uh, I don't know, crunchy uh, operator, but for some reason you decided to go to another vendor uh, like Ivan. Okay. So you can replace that in your uh, promises. The CRD won't change. Okay. So for the developer, it won't change anything. Uh, but uh, for you, uh, you can just switch to different implementation, etc. Well, all the beauty of composition. Okay. So that is how you can create the base blocks for your self-service, for your developers. Use existing operators, write your own operators, compose your operators. Okay. Let me go back to my slides. <laughs> how do you make your self service components available? Okay. Because we saw that we are using, uh, CRGs. Okay. And so we are creating then after CRD, we're creating a CR, a custom resource. And this custom resource, which is just a YAML file, we need to apply it on the cluster. Okay. So do we want to give direct access to our Kubernetes cluster to all our developers? So they can do kubectl apply dash F my potential dangerous CR. Okay. And maybe some of the developers, well, first of all, I, uh, they probably don't have access to the Kubernetes cluster. Okay. Uh, maybe they have no idea how Kubernetes work. Okay. Uh, they don't have kubectl installed and they don't want to learn that. And so in some cases, in small companies, you, you, for sure, you can do that, but you should consider something else. You should think of a tool that everybody knows. Okay. Developers ops, and that they are all using daily. And that could be used as a source of truth. And again, it's not the topic, but let me just mention that quickly. 
if you take Git as approach, okay, that all the resources, all the custom resources, so uh, all the desired states that I define as a developer, okay, I use Git to commit that. I say, I want a new Kafka cluster. So I write a CR that I showed you before, and then I do a Git commit and I do a Git push and that's it. Okay. And that is what we call GitOps. Okay. And this approach, the source of tools is Git. You push to Git and then you have components. Okay. That will listen to, uh, that will monitor this Git repo. And for any time there's a change, okay. It will pick up this resource and write it on, apply it on the cluster. If someone changed something on the cluster directly, the GitOps tool will detect that and revert it because the source of truth is, is Git. Okay. Single source of truth, treat everything as code. You notice I haven't mentioned infrastructure as code uh, um, from the beginning, but it's one essential component when you can declare, you can do, can, when you can declare desired state, that means that you can write it in code. And the, that also means if you're using Git, that you can benefit from all the workflows from Git. Okay. Reverting, committing, um, opening pull requests, merge requests, if you're using GitLab. Okay. So that's really powerful. So does that mean that everyone, all the developers will use their, your soft service components through Git? Yes, it could be. Okay. That is one way of doing it. But what is true is that the single interaction between your CRs and your base platform, Kubernetes, or your IDP in this case, okay, must be your GitOps component. There must no be no other way. If you're writing a CLI, perfect. Developers love CLIs, okay. I love writing CLIs and I love CLIs. But your CLI, when you perform an action, what it should do? It should create a commit. It should not interact directly with the uh, with the, the the Kubernetes cluster or the API. It should just follow the GitOps flow. Okay, just remember this. Okay, so we come back here to the situation uh, where I showed you the the the, the custom resource of um, of Kafka, and you saw that you can do. A lot of things, okay. Yeah, basically, and that's normal because you, as an operator provider, um, you want to expose your whole API of your service, and um, it can be a lot of things. Like uh, the Ivan operator, uh, when you open, a, um, when you provision a Postgres, you can choose your cloud provider, Amazon, uh, Google Cloud, um, uh, Azure, okay. These are things maybe that you don't want to expose to your, uh, to your uh, developers. Okay. Uh, because of compliance. Oh, that's really funny. That was, um, <laughs> no, it's good. So yeah, you don't want, you don't want to show that it's the automatic emoticons of uh, my iPhone. You don't want to expose everything. So how can you limit that? Well, um, by using the two techni techniques that I showed you before, so writing your own operator can shield, can create an abstraction, can create a facade for a vendor operator. Okay. That's one way of doing that. The other way is using uh, Kratex uh, and compose your operator. And since you define the CRD, you only expose what you want. These are two ways of doing it. And by the way, uh, there are, there aren't uh, mutually exclusive. You can do a combination of uh, both of them. Um, that's another way of doing that as well. Uh, and again, it's also not exclusive. You can use all the free techniques. The, the other way of doing that is uh, by implementing an internal developer portal, okay? Where you will be able to implement some of this logic, okay? Without having to touch the surface API of your operator, okay? So again, you create a facade and you create, since it's a portal, you create a UI component. Okay. So if you, as a developer, don't know how to use Git, for instance, well, I guess you, you all know, but 
but maybe your manager uh, wants also to use this portal because there are some metrics on the on, on the portal. Okay, so having a UI interface to define this can be a good option. And basically, uh, if we uh, focus on the self service side. Uh, I'm a developer, I go on a portal, I click on a button, create a microservice, bam. Well, you need to code it, but it's almost in production. Remember all the steps we saw before? Well, uh, the combination of operators, GitOps approach, plus giving it a nice interface, but it's way more than a UI interface with a portal, can be a really powerful uh, combination to create really a self-service um, a, a, a great self-service experience, okay? In a portal, what will you find? Uh, mainly you will have a, a dashboard, okay, with metrics. You will have a software catalog showing uh, what is deployed or what you could deploy. It could be a list of your images, of your running services, scorecards to say um, if your, 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 the, the, your microservice uh, is ready to go to production, how many PRs are open, Self-service, that is what really interests us. Workflow automation, and of course, security is important. And you want to integrate role-based access control, maybe even for a self-service, depending on your uh, role, you will have more or less option showing on the UI to uh, to deploy your, your, um, your self-service action. But don't forget, uh, if you went for the GitOps approach, even your portal will need to make sure that it calls a backend that is doing a GitOps flow. Okay, so um, before I conclude, I want you to give you a small demo of a portal. Okay, um, I'm going to show port because yeah, that's where I work. Um, the other options are building your own port uh, portal. Okay, if you have, if you like front ends, you like CSS, and you know all the different workflows of a portal. Uh, and you are ready to operate it, to manage it, to uh, to to maintain it. Uh, yeah, why not? Uh, you can go the the open source solution uh, with Backstage, which was one of the first one, uh, a really popular one. Um, you have to operate it yourself, and um, yeah, it can be quite complicated. Uh, there are just a lot of options available. I'm going to show you Port because yeah. I love port. It's really impressive. Um, I show me you here the open demo. Okay, so if you go to demo.getport.io, uh, you have here <laughs> no sign up. Okay, okay, you just go there and you can look around a bit. So you can see some dashboards here. We have our software catalog. Okay, and you can see it's com a combination of workloads of um, of GitHub related thing, PR health. Okay. Uh, uh, I have some pull requests without a Jira issue, etc. A lot of things. And I have my self-service components. That's what I want, okay? Uh, I need an S3 access. I click create, okay? I say uh, I want it for one hour. Uh, reason uh, needed for a test, okay? Uh, access level. Um, I just need to write there, okay? And uh, the instance, there's no instances here because it's a demo, okay? And I execute it, okay? Cool. <coughs> Discard changes. The great thing here is the builder. So all those components, okay, all these models, you can uh, visual visually um, design them here in the builder. And uh, that is basically your model that you define, okay? And you can create relations between different entities di di between different blueprints, okay? So me, what I told you in the beginning, CRDs should be the center uh, of your platform, okay? The, the, the core domain of your platform. Um, port supports that. And let me just go here to my, uh, my own portal, uh, my own account where I've been playing. And remember, I, I told you I was playing with a, a Quake, with a Quake, um, operator where you can deploy to a Quake service. Um, this blueprint here, I didn't, I didn't create it. That was created for me. And uh, just show you why, because I created a data source that connects my portal with my uh, Kubernetes cluster, okay? And uh, here I can define mappings. 
And here, let me move around. I want to show you just this line here, CRD to discover. Okay. So basically I tell him here, I tell port, Hey, can you ask the cluster if there's any custom resource definition that has the name quakesebi.org? Okay. And when I say, can you ask the Kubernetes uh, cluster, it will ask a port controller running in my cluster. Okay. And it will send him this request and my controller in my cluster will check and will find this CRD and will send data back to port and port. What will, what will port do? Well, he will create for me this blueprint. Okay. And he will create for me this self-service action for me. Day one. Okay. Creating a server, but also, uh, day two update quake. Okay. Or delete. Okay. So the credit operation and he scaffold that for me. Of course, then I'm able to, to, <coughs> to change the UI, etc. Uh, but if I go here for edit, so the user form, I can decide exactly what I want to expose. Okay. And to not expose, or if I want to use some, uh, some limits, etc. time limits maps here, I can say, Hey, I want to be it uh, a list of options. And I give here, uh, all the different options, all the different maps that it can use. Okay. And, um, and then I define the backend. Okay. So basically here I say, cool, please call a git up action here. Okay. Uh, and that get up action will take my input, recreate a CR and apply it on the cluster. That easy. Um, <coughs> let's try it out. Okay. Uh, discard changes and I say, create, create a quick, quick, create, a, create a quick free server. Okay. Uh, live demo. Quake server. There we go. I want those maps. Maybe I remove this one and I add this one. Okay. That's my preferred map. I want uh, six players at least and a time limit of uh, 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, so here I press execute and what happens in the backend? Uh, well, I have here, I should have here. I get up action that I started. Okay. And that will create a CR. I told you, you should always go for get ups here. It's not the perfect example because here my action will apply directly on the cluster. We have also examples of, of, um, uh, of using a GitOps approach. Okay. Here, I just did it for demo purposes, but again, in your action, you do whatever you want and, uh, looks like it's, uh, it's done here. So, uh, I'm just curious. Let me see. Let me go to my default namespace. And if I do kubectl get quake, I should have at least three, uh, two. Okay. Uh, this one I created uh, three days uh, ago and this one that I just created now. Cool. So he has created service for me and uh, get service. Okay. I should have here my service. Cool life quake. I should be able to, 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 to play quick as well. Uh, I can even go back here on my portal, on my catalog. And uh, if I go here to my, uh, quick server service. Okay. The one I live demo. Okay. That is the one. And I should be able to click here. I think so. Oh, look, and I enter my name. So I created the wheel <laughs> self-service action. Uh, deploying quake free service. You might think, Hey, uh, do a developer needs that? Yeah. <laughs> he might need it, but the main idea you understood that is I base that on, op on an operator. So a CRD and here the example is a quake. Okay. That's and this quake server, by the way, makes a deployment and service, etc. Uh, but Again, you can implement everything you want. So to recap, and I will conclude. Cognitive load of developers has increased a lot, a lot. Look, I lost my hair uh, because of that. Kubernetes should be your base platform. That is uh, not only my opinion, but um, it, I'm, I, I tell you, I'm opinionated on that. And I really be believe it will be the backbone. Okay. Um, CRDs are the core of your domain. 
that you want to expose as a self-service action. And really think how you will design your CRGs, discuss with your API teams, with your developers teams, uh, check what is the best flow. Build your own operating, uh, operator is not that hard. You can uh, pick the language that you want. Um, at one point, when you have a lot of operators, consider composing your different operators between them or write an operator to operate the operators, okay? GitHub is the way to provision your custom resources, which are, again, the basic block of your self-service component. Consider integrating an internal developer portal to remove any remaining friction. Okay, and again, it's not all exclusive. You can use your portal in combination with your own operators that you have composed with Quartix. Everything is possible, be pragmatic. And um, yeah, keep in mind that you want to make your developers happy. And that's it for me. It was really a pleasure to deliver uh, this talk. Um, See you soon, see you on stage, see you online, and please stay safe. Bye-bye.